Hey guys, so yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me this morning, uh, Senator Dave. There, appreciate you making the time. I understand it's a, a busy time of the season for for you, so no, really really appreciate it. So um, yeah, we'll just uh, we'll crack on. I've got some some questions prepared just on on kind of various things. I've spoke to, to a few different fans and fan groups and kind of collated some some questions from them as well. So um, yeah, I'll cover cover a few bases um, this morning. I think. Uh, I'll leave it up to you guys who who wants to to take these. Uh, no, no kind of no preference from me really. So um, yeah, just uh, one of the big things that I've been keen to, to talk to you about, and one of the the, the kind of big changes I've seen in the club uh, over the, the past wee while is, um, I, I suppose, a change in mentality um, that, that's coming from you know from the top down, um, and it's something that, that I've written before. Uh, about on the blog as well is is getting that winning mentality through through the club and not necessarily just settling for or you know setting our stall out at the beginning of the season just to finish third and, and maybe get that cup final you know to to try and set our inspiration and aspirations a, a wee bit higher than that so um, I just wanted to, to to really ask you how big uh, a factor has has that been for yourselves you know how important has it been to to instill that kind of mentality through the club and how, how big a factor was it when you came to uh, appointing uh, Stephen as, as a manager? Uh, hi Martin, well thanks for inviting us on and um, I think Rob and I, we all think as you know at the club it's important to communicate um, as often as we can and, and sometimes as we said earlier, when you put messages up there or the club does, it goes up once, it, maybe 5% of the fans get it, so it's important to repeat stuff and I think what you've seen, Martin, in the last four years, and Rob has been with us for three and a half now, is a real clear path towards a clear vision and a strategy, not just um, on the field, um, but also off the field as well. And I'll let Rob talk a bit, a, a wee bit about that. But Stephen Glass, I think, summed it up um, when he, he was appointed as manager that to be known as a successful Aberdeen manager, you've got to put a trophy in the cabinet. And so... I think when you start from there, then that's that's clearly the aim for us. Everybody knows the 60, 70 million, 80 million a year that Celtic and Rangers are, are, are paying in wages. And, you know, we're certainly the third highest. And, and as we mentioned before we come on here, our wage bill this season right now with the squad we've got and everyone we've got is going to be higher than last season. And so, uh, but with that, um, it really is, but going about our business from the academy through the development path to, to trying to level the playing field is, is a term we've used, Martin. And I'll give an example. Uh, we had a really, really young squad last night, went up to play broader Rangers, Highland League team, right? Top team mm -hmm. um, and um, real men. And we basically had an under 18 team out there other than a couple of players and they won one nil. And, and so what I would say to this is, is that when Aberdeen has been successful, Martin, if I go back to the Eddie Turnbull era, and maybe you and others don't remember that, but if Eddie Turnbull had stayed with us, we would have won the league, I bet. He went back to Hibs, his first kind of love. The Celtic were a top, top team then, you know, playing mm -hmm. in European finals, win a European final. We beat him in the 1970 Cup final. But if you've got the right leadership, you've got the right attitude, you've got the right development. And, and Aberdeen back then, young boys... <laughs> Not anymore, but young boys like Bobby Clark, Martin Buchan, Joe Harper. Arthur Graham was 17 years old when we won the Scottish Cup final against Celtic 3-1. And when you get that right balance with professionals, with the right leadership, on and off the field, along with younger people that are, are really promising, and Rob can probably touch on that with some of the management we've got at the ticket office and marketing and so on. You got that balance there. It's a recipe for success, in my view, and so fast forward, obviously, to Sir Alec Ferguson's time, Alex time, you know, and, and he, 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 he built on the one year, successful year of building the squad that Billy McNeil had. And so it, it really comes from the top and it's an attitude of, you know, philosophy wise, here's we want to play attacking, entertaining football, right? Um, we're going to invest and continue to invest. And we did not divest through this last period, Martin, in the youth academy, many people up in Scotland are divested and cut back on what they were spending. We've kept everybody employed at this club on and off the field because we need them. And I think that will stand us in, in, hopefully stand us in good stead. But again, back to Stephen, he said, 
to be a successful manager, you got to put a trophy in the cabinet. There's no reason why we shouldn't go out every game believing we can uh, win that game. And that means going to Glasgow with the intent of winning. And, 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 and it all kind of stems from there, um, I think. So, so, Rob, maybe you would want to add on to that with the, the commercial side, because we've got, you've got a tremendous group of young managers that are really um, uh, flourishing under this um, responsibility we've given them to deliver outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, Dale. You know, Martin, I think, you know, winning on the field is is one thing and, and, and you know, great performances on the park certainly help us from, from an off-field perspective. And as Dave says, we've got a, a very young, very enthusiastic, very committed group of individuals who take ownership for all the, the different departments that there are in the club. And, you know, they come together really well. And and, and we, I think we, we try we're, we're, wherever possible to try and punch above our weight from a commercial perspective. Yeah, the, the the ticketing side of it and and uh, and season tickets is one side of it, but fundamentally we have a very strong commercial offering. You know, we we um, from a from a hospitality perspective, we've got new catering partners on board. They've done a terrific job for us out at uh, out of the training ground. Baxter Story, and they've come on board and uh, and are helping us to drive what we can do from a hospitality perspective. We've brought on a, a range of new partnerships that the club's not had before over the last three or four years. That's really helped to boost us commercially. We're about 23% up in commercial revenue over the last few years. So that's giving us a strong, a strong boost. The fans have stepped up in, in terms of DNA and, and obviously season tickets, particularly through the pandemic. And for us, it's it's trying to take a, you know, a, a sort of a more modern commercial approach, trying to digitize, or trying to commercialize rather some of our digital inventory, for example, mm -hmm. um, and, and just consistently trying to punch above our weight and, and to be proud of. You know, who we are as a club, the, the prices that we charge, because we have a very strong demographic. For some brands, you know, we might just be a media buy. For others, they want to tap right into our demographic. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, we're, you know, commercially, we're at, 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 at the heart of it. We've, we've got a very strong proposition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's all really good to hear. I think as, as fans, that's all, you know, we're asking for, is, is to hear those, get you know, that kind of positivity coming coming from the club across the board and, you know, that we're setting out at, at, at the offset of the season to be to be challenging on, on every front, you know, so that's that's all we can, that's all we can ask for. Martin, one other thing I would just mention as well is, is like, like in any walk of life, we're not perfect. You know, we make mistakes. We're running at 100 miles an hour. We've got smart people that are there and it's about listening as well and getting that right balance and yeah. all we can have asked for is people to, to be to be constructive with the, the feedback and the input because clearly we've got um, a diverse group of fans as as we all know and, and being Aberdonians we're Aberdonians you know and um, I have to remind myself at times I'm an Aberdonian too. I think we're all guilty of that on uh, on Twitter especially. <laughs> no that's great. Um, so yeah moving, moving on a wee bit I think the one of the big successes over the, the past few seasons has been the, the DNA scheme um, and, you know, the contribution that that's made to the club has been, been massive. Um, you've talked before about, you know, that scheme potentially evolving and, and you know, maybe moving towards more of a, a subscription um, type uh, model and, and possibly a, like a full membership scheme. Um, could you maybe expand a bit on what you could, you know, what you think that might look like in the in the years to come, and and what that would mean for the fans? Sure. Yeah, we were we were just sitting yesterday in the in the Legends Lounge in in the Richard Donald stand having a, a meeting on this on this very subject, and okay. um, it's something that we think is is very important for us as a club as as we move forward. Um, the integration of our different product offerings is is really important. You know, we've got people who are buying just red TV. We've got people who are obviously in and out the retail store. We've got season ticket members. We've got DNA members, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the 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 single sign-on product that we've um, introduced now through our partner Sports Alliance that's a really important step. And I'd use this this opportunity, Martin, to appeal to fans who haven't yet. Um, gone and signed up for single sign on. Get, do that because your your experience with the club and 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 your engagement with the club is going to get that much easier because all of our systems, whilst they're independent and operated by different suppliers, needed to talk to one another. And by mm -hmm. creating the single sign on product, we've been able to do that. So fundamentally, you would be able to go on 
um, and not only sort out your tickets, but it can then very easily go and purchase something from the retail store. In time, we will integrate the red TV offering, et cetera. So for us, pulling all of those things together under one umbrella is, is really important. And that leads us longer term to looking at a, at a broader membership product because you know, I, I think there are, there are going to be opportunities. We almost think of a matrix system um, where you might look at, you know, I, I do want some red TV. I, I want to sit in X stand as a season ticket holder. I do want DNA because I want to be able to support the club in another way. And so this particular form of membership is, is what suits me best. Mm. So we're looking at all of those different tiers and, and, and that sort of matrix as to what, what might work best in, in, over time and, and suit the fan base as a whole. There might be people who only want a very basic level of access to red TV, for example. Um, they might want to buy, I don't know, a six-match package because they work offshore, um, but they feel that DNA to them is really important. So is there a combination that we can provide to them? As a, as a member and that, that's the sort of longer term way in which we're looking to to approach this if i yeah. could just add to no, that no. martin i mean i think that the rob's point is that um you know if you think about when people are, have memberships of gyms for example etc and um and they pay on a monthly basis now obviously the club every club has been used to getting in our case probably two million um a year of season tickets um, over the summer months, and, and that obviously helps the cash flow itself. But keeping that aside, um, I think it's our belief as a management team that in moving to a monthly membership um, approach, which uh, we talked about yesterday, and it might take us a couple of seasons to get there, Martin, because it's important to get it right and, and to, to maybe take baby steps to get there. But obviously we offer 10 months and we offer 10 months to pay stuff, et cetera. But if we've got a membership and people can choose who they want to be, right, on there, then there should be this umbrella membership where everybody is Aber DNA. Mm -hmm. I'm an Aber DNA season ticket holder. I'm an Aber DNA international red TV um, individual. And so the team is working through all, all of that. Um, and if people pay for it on a monthly basis, like they do their mobile phones, et cetera, it certainly is very more helpful to individuals um, financially to be here. Plus, you know, um, you know, we absolutely want, um, it's not about, uh, as I said earlier, before we jumped on this, it's not about the board and the fine, but all of us, you know, mm -hmm. it's about trying to say, look, this is the right thing for the club moving forward because it has to be sustainable, Martin, you know, uh, we will spend 14 to 15 million this season on running the club. And the vast, vast majority of that is wages, right? Yeah. Season tickets bring in 2 million, 8,300 8, season ticket holders, 2 million net of VAT, right? And so, um, you know, the, 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 the season um, tickets themselves cover uh, and, 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 we're delighted to have these people because that's the lifeblood of the club. But at 8,300 season ticket holders, it covers a fraction of what the cost is of running the club. Yeah. So the, the DNA membership is an opportunity for people, yes, to get discounts on season tickets, yes, to get discounts on retail, etc. It's an opportunity for people to help the club out that want to help the club out, and it's an option. And I know there's been a wee bit of friction over DNA, non-DNA, and hopefully this overall membership scheme will put that to bed because we'll all be our DNA. But for me, that's 700,000 after discounts from DNA on top of the 2 million is a godsend, mm -hmm. right? Without that, we would be nowhere near um, the wages that um, we have been able to, to pay and command for the team. And just again, to put it in perspective, this season, because again, we're just coming out of COVID, this season we'll probably lose two and a half million as a club. And, and so that's okay, that's fine. Um, because you know, we'll, we'll make allowance for that. But to be sustainable, we have to drive up our season ticket sales, our membership approach and offer value to all the fans. So I know if you've got questions later on about fan engagement and things, but, but let's also, let's put it in perspective, Martin. Right, then 
and I mentioned this, it's great that Motherwell have done the scheme for the unemployed. We have a similar scheme just now, Aberdeen for all. But first mantra was we're all for Aberdeen Football Club. Then it's Aberdeen should be for everybody. Mm -hmm. We give away 400 tickets through our charitable partners for every single game we have. Now, we're looking at that just now to say, well, delivering those through all of these charities, is that the right way to do it? Or should we build in through our trust? Should we build in a mechanism there that's more specific to people that you know have financial challenges? And so the trust is looking at that just now. But let's not forget, we give away 400, 400 tickets to every single game. In addition to that, the Aberdeen A Junior Scheme, which is really us nurturing fans of the future, we will likely give away 30,000 vouchers to primary school kids in Aberdeen next season. No charge to come to the club mm. and enjoy a game, enjoy the festivities that are there. So, you know, there are a number of schemes that are there, Martin, and we'll continue to look at that and, and continue to try and evolve that. But overall, I think that, you know, we're all members of the football club. It doesn't matter whether you've got one share or no shares, but we're members of Aberdeen Football Club and moving to a subscription model is a better way financially, I believe long-term, we believe long-term long, long -term for the club to engage more fans. Yeah, no, certainly. I appreciate the honesty with the figures there as well. It's uh, a wee bit of a surprise to myself. I kind of maybe assumed that, you know, now we were in a position to be getting folk back into the stadiums that we would be would be uh, in a money-making position again as well. So, yeah, I think that probably puts things into perspective a well, little bit, what you've said. Well, Martin, look, Martin, at the end of the day, from four years ago, our wage bill, football wage bill, has doubled. Mm. Right? Our football wage bill has doubled. And a lot of that's down to the competitive nature as well of, of the league. And, um, you know, um, I mean, four or five years ago, Rangers were just kind of back into it. Hearts and Hibs were up and down, up and down. Dungeon United were down for five years. We're in a different ball game just now. And so for me, it really is about, we are speculating to accumulate, mm. right? Um, but it's okay because, you know, we've got the, you know, obviously the, the guys, myself and others that are back in the club will cover it. But you know, we're, we're investing significantly. We'll continue to invest significantly to get our season ticket base rise, uh, to, to rise up. So, um, but that's just, just the perspective where we're at. Okay, no, that's great. Um, so just still maybe on the, the kind of longer term, um, the, the position of the fans and, and getting greater representation, um, do you see, you know, potentially getting greater representation on the board um, come time um, from the fans? And um, is there any possibility of uh, even moving towards uh, like a full fan ownership model when your tenure finally comes to an end? Hopefully, hopefully not, not anytime soon, but um, longer term. Well, thanks, Martin. I appreciate you saying <laughs> that. I'm 62 and I'm still kicking around, you know. Oh, you've got Listen, you, yeah. um, so let's put it kind of, kind of in, in perspective. I mean, I like to think that the club is fan owned right now because I'm a fan and I have 39% ownership of the club. I don't have majority ownership. Um, Stuart still has uh, where it is 14, 15% and my friends in the States, between me and my friends in the States, we've got about 76% of the club. Yeah. But I like to think that the, the club is owned by fans because I'm not sitting in here in some ivory tower I'm not here, for example, to, I mean, nobody's making money in Scottish football, right? And, and that comes to another question, maybe for another, um, another uh, blog session, another time about running Scottish football, which, yeah, there's huge opportunity for us to be better, Martin. But for me, this is about trying to put a smile on me and Fiona, our home city, right? And, um, and it's not about money. If I wanted to make money, I wouldn't be doing this and I'd be trying to put money into more software companies. So it's a tough gig to have. So with fan representation, I would hope that fans feel that there are fans on the board led by myself and that the fans are being engaged with on a regular basis. Um, I mean, Zoe is on board now as well, who's been a fan, right? And daughter plays you know, on the team um, itself. But as far as the, moving on to the fan ownership is concerned, 
I think the club has had 20 million of investment in the last four years. It's delivered um, Cormac Park. It's delivered, um, it's delivered money till we could speculate to accumulate and it's helped us get through the pandemic. And we're not out of it yet, which is why the turnover will be down a bit this year because the corporate side isn't back there yet because mm -hmm. understandably, businesses are having a tough time. But the, the question on fan ownership is this as well as, and, and listen, when we come up with the, the plans for the new stadium and all the rest of it, the fans will have an opportunity to, to invest at that stage if they so, if they so desire. But the reality is we've had 20 million in the last four years during a time where there's been a pandemic and Aberdeen's been hit oil-wise. I don't know how much demand there is there um, because we've got 55 million to find for the new stadium. And there are other things we would have wanted to do at Cormac Park. So how we go about finding that 55 million or longer term, how we go about um, the club hitting another pandemic or an issue, how much were the fans, you know, for example, um, be able to step up if the oil has a bad time again or there's, there's recessions? That would be my kind of concern um, itself. But we've got 50 million to raise, and I don't think there's 50 million out there, you know, in amongst the fan base that we could raise tomorrow. And so, but what I would say is, is that um, from, from my tenure, for as long as that is, five, 10 years, who knows, right? I'll do this as long as I feel like I'm adding value. Um, I think that, you know, my goal, our goal is to try and get a new stadium that's fit for purpose, quality rather than quantity, and to be able to allow us to, um, to, 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 to level uh, the playing field. And so it's a bit of a, um, it's a, bit of a, a, a kind of question as to um, down the line, how much could the fans want to raise and run, run the club um, uh, in and of, of itself? But again, I would hope today people feel like that it is fan owned and that me and the others are trying to do our best to engage with the fans. Listen, you know on social media, right, that the fans have got diverse opinions, right? And so um, and you imagine some of them you know, sitting on a board trying to make some decisions and raise 50 million, then I'm not trying to kind of quash it per se, but, you know, um, it's uh, we've all got diverse kind of opinions. But look, for me, we will look at this next phase of the money we need to raise as a club. And we'll look at that and say, look, is there room there for whatever the number is? 10% of the stadium for the fans to want to invest in that and we provide tangible value. But remember this, we took fans' money back in the 90s, right? And because, the, because of the, uh, the scheme, because of the broadcasting revenue going nowhere near what we thought it would proportion to England, you know, then that, um, yes, I've still got a couple of thousand shareholders, but... I, I would only want to engage upon that if it was the right things for the fans and that we were fairly transparent with them on the use of the money. Yeah, oh, that's fair enough. Yeah, I don't, I don't think uh, anybody could accuse yourself or, or Rob of being in an ivory tower when you see some of the, the interactions that you get on Twitter. <laughs> I certainly don't, uh, don't envy you uh, some of the time. Maybe you could respond to some of the DMs I get. <laughs> <laughs> should see some of the well, some of the ones I get. I can only imagine some of the ones you get. So, <laughs> uh, no, it's great. That's great. Listen, in saying that, Martin, I would tell you ninety percent of the people, ninety plus percent, have been fantastic. Yeah. I mean, you know, I call people as well. I I, I I'm I call fans um, as a sounding board behind the scenes. I'll I'll DM somebody and say, oh, let's catch up. We have a chat with these people. We all want the same thing, Martin, at the end of the day. It's not about us and them. That, I mean, I hate that pretentiousness. It really is about how can we overall as a group of people put a smile on the city's face? Because when the football club does well, Aberdeen smiles. And then everybody says, how are you doing? Nay bad. And as we talked about <laughs> earlier, nay bad in Aberdeen in the States would be awesome, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't it get much better than there, bud? <laughs>
Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, I just wanted to move on to some um, questions more around kind of fan experience. Um, reached out to a few fans on on Twitter and, and various other places to to get a few topics for this as well. So uh, hopefully, kind of covering most of the things that that folk wanted uh, brought up. Um, one of the big um, topics of discussion, I suppose, um, from a folk I spoke to was around um, the possible reintroduction of alcohol at the grounds. Um, a lot of folk. That I spoke to felt that was kind of you know the biggest game changer potentially for a fan experience uh, in this country. Um, do you guys have a position on that? Does the club have a position on that? Is that something that you're you know, actively pursuing or trying to make representations to the government and the, to the governing bodies on? Or how do, how do you see that panning out? Um, Martin, I'll, I'll take this one. Yeah, from, from our point of view, we, we see it as fairly fundamental and, and very important. If you think about the amount of lost revenue that the clubs have um, had to forego as a, as a result of those, those regulations, um, we, we aren't actively engaged in, in, a, in, a, in a representation sense, but there are a number of clubs who are looking at the broader commercial piece right across Scottish football in terms of, you know, as Dave said earlier, what, what can we do better? Um, as individual clubs and as a league as a whole and the alcohol side of it is certainly something that forms part of, of that discussion you know in, in any new stadium for example for us we'd certainly want to see a, a supporters bar you know along the lines of what we've seen for example at Hearts um, <clears throat> we've got some, some some interesting ideas I'd like to make it 75 meters long and, and take the title away from Spurs as having the longest bar in Europe if I can <laughs> but um, you know, there's 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 certainly lots of opportunity there, um, and you know the timing is you know is is it right, ideal now just coming out of COVID? Perhaps not, you know, but certainly in, in in the not too distant future, I think that's a conversation that that has to be had because it's uh, a, as I say a, a revenue source for the club that's that all the clubs that's you know really really important. If I could maybe just add to that, Martin, you know, I think that. Um, there have been moves towards looking at this, but I think Police Scotland were the ones that just absolutely were against it. And so I think it absolutely needs to be visited. Um, and, um, you know, 70, 80% of the games at Pittori, we've got no police, right? Yeah, exactly. Now, we all know we all know the games that might be challenges for having alcohol. But rather than, you know, um, tar everybody with the same brush, or every game with the same brush, there's definitely opportunity to test this. Look, Ron Gordon, who's become a good friend of mine, that, that's um, the, the chairman and owner at Hebs. I mean, Ron and I have talked about, you know, could we actually have like a fan zone where there are fans from Aberdeen and Hibs, for example, that are enjoying a beer before a game. Now, I don't know whether that's possible to pull off. Right, but unless we try it, unless we educate people, unless we try some of these things, you know, these, I mean, some of the buses come up to Aberdeen and they're basically, they're bussed into Pataudry, they're bussed out of Pataudry, they can't go to pubs and stuff. But it do, does bring a social responsibility as well, Martin, to it amongst the fans so that we are acting more like rugby uh, fans per se. But having said that, and we will pursue that, as Rob says, it's a key cornerstone for us. Then the fan engagement before the games, you know, we've talked about getting a marquee out of the cricket pitch. Now, with everything that's going on, I mean, this last few weeks, between even the regulations, we're having testing before you come into Pittori. I mean, Thursday night, the game tomorrow night, you know, you, the, you have to have photo ID to be able to get in because of track and trace, and which is why we've got people you know, coming sta on a staggered basis into the into the stadium again, it's put a lot of pressure on us. But you know, Rob at the right stage will come out, and we will test the um, we will test that marquee approach, even things like the beach ballroom in yeah. and of itself. You know, um, but there are things we can do before the games, such as make it you know a nice place to come, and as long as it's affordable, right? So the beer and the food in a marquee for let's say eight hundred people. It would have to be affordable. I learned that from Atlanta United, where Arthur Blank, the owner there, Robin, Rob's been out there too. And you make the beer, you make the food um, uh, reasonably priced, like mm. in a pub, so that people don't have to go to a pub to get the experience. And they're doing it here before, before a game. But, uh, you know, there'll be more in the next week or two, Martin, on the homecoming game, which we're gearing towards Ross County, which um, 
you know, we're really, we're really looking forward to and aiming to do some stuff with the younger fans there as well inside, uh, inside the South Stand and probably the, um, the Richard Donald Stand if it's raining, for example. Yeah, no, that sounds sounds promising. I'm kind of glad to hear it's it's on the radar. Um, I, I I wrote a, a piece a while back about you know looking at other European countries and their kind of fan experiences versus ours, and you know Scotland's down at the bottom in terms of what we can you know what we can actually do. Um, at that time, I wasn't any standing, I wasn't any kind of safe pyro, um, and we weren't allowed to to drink in the grounds either. So yeah, fundamentally. You know why were we being treated differently to, to other fans across Europe? I, I couldn't agree more. We have absolutely got to work with government and with the police. Certainly, us as a club to demonstrate that we're good custodians and we know how to run events. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, one of the, I suppose, one of the big success stories on the on the fan experience side of things has been has been the red shed and. I, you know, now with fans coming back in a season, I can I can only see it going from from strength to strength. I think that's got to be a really um, big success story, and uh, you know, hopefully help kind of drive the team on as well with the the, the atmosphere created in there. If um, you know, as a success uh, over a, over a, the period, have you looked at the possibility of uh, maybe introducing safe standing in in that area? Is that something that we could look at, or is it potentially you know just just for a new stadium? It's um it's become a bit of a pet project for me this Martin um and, and I've chatted to a number of a number of folk about it um the the reality of the of the engineering that would be required given the ground that we've got in the red shed and and the the, the aging concrete that's there mm-hmm. um, and the depth you've got to go down to create a, a safe environment is something that probably isn't going to be practical um with within the confines of the of the Merkland stand. But it is very, very much uh, top of mind and on our radar for the new stadium. With uh, I see Liverpool are just about to um, uh, introduce some, some new rail seats. Yeah. Um, we, we've seen it more and more in Scottish football and, and clubs looking at it. Um, it. It's definitely something that we want to look at for the new stadium. Um, this will be part of the fan consultation piece. For us, it's going to be really important to get a sense of what those sort of numbers would be, you know, how many fans do you know, might be in that area, and then specifically where that area might be located within the ground. Um, but so v- very much on our radar, but I, I think something that is we would probably say, say is unlikely for the Merkin, just given the given the constraints and the, the sheer cost probably of, of, of what we'd have to do within there. We have looked at it elsewhere in the ground. Um, the only place that it is in any way vaguely practical is actually in the in the Richard Donald stand because of the depth of the cement and, okay. and the size of the step. Um, but then you you start when, when you when you do that. We've actually had some some sample seats sent up to us, and we put those um, temp- temporarily install those in to, to look at, at some issues. And you start to come um, to issues with sight lines. So if you had, for example, if you put people on the on the extreme left hand side um, of the Richard Donald stand lower, if you were in the stand on the left hand side. Um, folks sitting in the center would struggle to see a corner being taken for example yeah. and if you the same problem if you shifted it over to the other side so there's some practical challenges with it not something that was perhaps thought about when that stand was initially built um but as i say something that we you know very keen to see um further down the line in the new stadium yeah 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 no it's, it's promising i mean essentially i think you know with the different initiatives that you're talking about potential safe standing and marquees and, and that type of thing you're you're really looking at you know, creating that away day experience atmosphere type thing at, at home, you know. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's what we should be aiming for, I think. I think there are a couple of other things I, I just mentioned. You know, folk who are, are in the South Stand are going to see some some changes. We've got some really nice branding that's going up on the on the I-beams behind the, the South Stand. Next week before our homecoming game, we're getting some, some really um, super looking banners that are going up that, that um, look back at some of the club's success and some of our history. Those are going up on the on the uh, on the outside of the main stand. Um, we've got, we've ex- expanded the role, if you like, and the personnel um, within our supporter engagement team as well. So they're going to be more people, almost in a sort of a fan greeter capacity, that are going to be out. Um, and rather being, than being a, a steward who's who's there in a very different role, these are people to help you with wayfinding. You know, we're, we're seeing more people coming to the stadium who've not been to Pataudry before, which is fantastic. We've, mm-hmm. As Dave talked about, we've got lots of youngsters now through the DNA Junior Programme. For many of them, it'll be their first experience at Pataudry. 
and they're going to be needing to know where to go or where to find a program or where to find a loo. So these people will be helping to provide, um, you know, a much warmer match day experience, shall we say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that maybe on the same, a similar kind of track, the, the, the segmentation thing that you've, you've talked about recently and, you know, not treating every fan the same and, sure. and that they're looking for the same experience, that's, that's fundamental for me. You know, I think for a bit too long, maybe the entire focus was on like the family experience and, you know, some of the other kind of demographics were, were ignored a wee bit. So I, I think you've got it bang on by, by trying to, you know, look, look at look at different groups individually. Martin, it's a trait. It's a trait in football. You know, the game's at three o'clock on Saturday. It's whatever it is, twenty quid for adults and a tenner for kids. Hopefully, you'll come. <laughs> and and so, you know, with the our DNA Junior program, we're hoping that these fans. There's eight thousand signed up now. There's forty three thousand primary school kids, and we want a lot more to be members of the club. And what we do with these kids is, and uh, we'll give them probably between two, we've guaranteed two vouchers to games in a year. It might end up being four, right? Um, um, but it's it's a group we can nurture and, and and the trust with the coaching and that are in are in every primary school. And we run primary schools football on at a weekend for um, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. And so it's incumbent upon us to make those kids feel that they're part of Aberdeen Football Club. So you know, we'll end up probably with 30,000 of its four per person um, vouchers going out. That will encourage their parents to come with them, you know, as well, maybe to games. And it has to be compelling for them to want to be there. So you'll see things that what Rob and the team are going to do for the homecoming game um, for, uh, for, for, for Ross County. But, but, but that's how you really have to um, uh, kind of segment it. The other thing yep. is we committed to these DNA junior members, Martin, that before we went into COVID, when we were talking about it, that they would all be able to come to Pataudry through the front door, go to the media room, sign for the Dons with a photo shoot, and then go out through the pitch. Now, right. I could imagine as a seven-year-old kid, if I had that opportunity, you know, unbelievable. Oh, and yeah. I have to remind people, I remind myself, how powerful, right, the people at the club and the players and the management team, how powerful it is for them to engage with our fans, you know, and, and it really is amazing, the goodwill, it's humbling. You know, we've had, you know, this trip pandemic, Mark, we've had a number of fans die, a number of fans have committed suicide. I mean, some of the stuff that you hear, mm -hmm. it breaks your heart. Yeah. So it's incumbent upon us to be as a club overall, um, and not just it's empathetic, not just empathetic, but it's the right thing to do to engage. So those kids, and um, we're hoping, right? No commitment as yet, but if 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 COVID aside, that starting in the next school holidays, we're going to be able to bring those kids into the club. Now there's eight thousand of them now, so it'll take a while to do it, right? But into the club to be able to sign for the dons with a photo shoot. In the media room and go out to the pitch and um, if they haven't collected their two vouchers for a free game to come to as under 12s they can collect them there as well I just think that's the type of um, nurturing that needs to go on if we aspire to get to 15,000 season ticket holders in a new stadium let's say then you have to target these different areas I mean we've wanted for a while going back to the red shed I mean listen I grew up in the beach end right um, with, the, with the Doc Martens and the big white jeans and, and stuff. and um, But you've got the red shed there. There's an absolute demand there for a couple of thousand people to be in there and and, 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 and kind of be, be raucous. And I have to give credit to Rob. It was Rob that came up with the term red shed. So I um, thought it was a fantastic thing. We've had the street artists in. They've, you know, they've, they've decorated oh, it. Oh, yeah. Looks great, yeah. And, and so, and these things didn't just happen. It's investment, a distinct investment in the club to do it. But so hopefully you're getting the impression holistically, but we're looking to target all types, families, those people that want to come on their own. The average age of people in the Red Shed is probably about 28 years old, mm -hmm. right? The average age of our season ticket holder overall is 41. Mm -hmm. So that's the demographic. You know, that's a story, yeah. yeah. Of course, if I went in myself, that would, 
probably <laughs> increase the edge to about 32. I, I promise to go in there. I was going to say, should maybe roll that, that uh, signing initiative to the adults as well. I can think of a few, uh, few managers that would be signing up for that as well. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, moving, moving on a wee bit then. Um, we've spoke a bit about new stadium, new facilities, that type of thing. I think the, one of the big kind of stories over, over the past wee while is you know, this um, idea about potentially staying in the city um, and, and the council. Um, offering help um, to, to get a new stadium going down at the beach. Uh, just wanted to hear a bit more about that, really. Um, is it fair to say that the staying in the city would be the preferred option for the, the stadium, all things being equal? Um, and, um, you know, does, does council involvement in, in this new project potentially affect some of the kind of additional revenue generation ideas that you had for the, the new stadium? Yeah, no, it's a good question, Martin. And obviously there's been a lot of stuff around about it and we've, Rob and I have both talked about it. Um, you know, the, the, the stadium being at the beach was never an option for the club going for Kingsford, you know? And we've spent the last 20 years and about four million pounds trying to find a new home over the last 20 years. And that's what's sit there on the accounts as, as what we've spent. Um, and so um, obviously going through the pandemic, um, the city council um, have got good aspirations. I mean, Teka, and I know we're going through COVID, but Teka, it blew me away. I, I went to the BBC Sports Personality of the Year event there with some, some of our executives over from Atlanta United. Absolutely blown away what Teka does do for the city, bring football to the city. So if you look at Aberdeen, I mean, I hadn't walked down Union Street for maybe fully for two or three years, mm. coming back. And I was just, I mean, uh, goodness sake, I, I just was embarrassed is probably the word, walking down Union Street. I mean, as a kid, and even though I lived in a council flat in Garth D at the time, my mom would dress us up, me and my brother up, to go into town shopping. Yeah. Dressed up to go shopping. Mm-hmm. You know? And you go down there. But listen, I, I believe, um, and, and some of this is just reading the same stuff as, as you guys are, I believe that the regeneration of the city centre is crucial for Aberdeen, having people living in the centre there as well, maybe more cafe bar shops, pedestrianising mm-hmm. Union Street, um, the boulevard itself, making a real feature of the boulevard. Maybe we don't need four lanes of traffic there, maybe it's two. What can you do with that? But uh, the stage we're at right now, Martin, is, is that the council are leading on all of this. And we're, let's say, an interested party. I think there's a recognition amongst business and economic development that losing the club to the city centre will be a major economic challenge for the city, getting football and increasing football um, to the city and to, to the beach area. So, I mean, for me, I'm excited as an Aberdonian for what the master plan is there. And for me and for Rob and our board, if we've got a stadium that is there, it needs to be something that, that the, the term is you sweat the asset. We don't want something that's used once every two weeks, right? We want something that's used from a community perspective. We've got a fabulous trust and we do wonderful things. And when we're fully out of COVID with the walking clubs and the use of the facilities, the Alzheimer's programs we've got, there's an opportunity there to build something that is club and community oriented that would bring significant economic value. So, I mean, I'm a, as you know, I'm a technology guy by background and with some of my investors and the groups I work with, we are invested in a whole number of esports teams. And um, Rob and I are able to tap into these people running some of the, the top esports franchises in the world. And so I think about, you know, space and facility there right, being used every day. You think about, why can we have an, an e-sports call it arena, an environment where you know, you're encouraging people in the city to come and, and hang there and maybe there's tournaments for people in the city play gaming against each other. Now, listen, I'm, I'm just talking out loud here, right? But right now where we are is, is that the, the city council is looking to be bold with this regeneration because there's, we've got one opportunity to actually restore the city centre. The beach is 
unbelievably beautiful. I mean, mm. what an asset. And everything that's there is the end of life, right? And so um, just like Dundee have done, right? You've got to take your hats off to Dundee for what they have done regeneration-wise. And um, we need to do the same, in my view, as a city in Aberdeen. And if the stadium, from a community perspective, is to be part of that, we're absolutely up for the conversation of making that a reality. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree. I'm, uh, I'm Dundee based now, actually. I've been down here for a few years, so I've seen the, the kind of impact that that regeneration's had, and it's, yeah, it's been it's been massive. So there's no reason why Aberdeen can't be doing some of the same. And, uh, I was about to say, I'm sorry you're living in Dundee. <laughs> uh, I've, I've needed to stop singing some songs at the football now that I'm down here. <laughs> can, um, can you hear sort of the bypass there? It's unbelievable. Oh, I know, it's, it's definitely missing that, that's for sure. <laughs> No, that's good though. Um, just on, well, yeah, I, I, I think that's that's great on the the stadium side of things. I suppose just on um, Cormac Park as well. Um, I think we're kind of all aware of how big a boost that's been to the club in terms of attracting new players and um, helping the coaching staff with it, with the players that we've got. You know, um, I, I suppose when when it first kind kind of came about, I was I was further plans to to develop um, and and add other things onto Cormac Park. Is that still? Is that still in the plan? Is there still um, potential for getting maybe indoor facilities there, or how how do you see that planning out over over the next while? I know we're financially, you've said you know things are, are tough at the moment, but maybe longer term, w- what are the plans for for Cormac Park? Well, I think it's a good question, Martin, and I think I mean Rob, you can chime at the end, but I think that if let's say the beach projects are reality, then clearly there are things that we would want to do at Cormac Park as well. I mean it would be great for us to be able to have like a reserve pitch the way you've got the bleachers so you can actually play the, the women's games there, for example. And by the way, not against um, the women playing at Pitaudry for some games, you know, it all comes down to the state of the pitch and when we do it. But, um, you know, the women's team has been a massive boost for us um, as well as, you know, as, 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 as a club. So when you think about things we'd like to do here, Yes, it would be nice to have an indoor pitch. Obviously, we can use the sports village, but it's about a two and a half million project. Mm -hmm. I'll remind people as well that the training ground here was supposed to cost us nine to 10 million. We spent best part of 14 million on it now. And and, 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 and the bulk of the increase there were things that we would have had to have done in three or four years time. And we made the decision to do them then, a couple of years ago, rather than wait and, and tear the place up and, and, and kind of redo it. So I think, the, I think the, the, the answer to the question really is it would be tied in, Martin, with the, for example, the, the Kingsford Stadium project, if that went ahead, or with the beach project, we'll then take a look at the, the cost. I mean, the stadium project is going to be 55 million project. Yeah. You know, I mean, we could build it a lot, lot cheaper, but, you know, we want something that, is quality rather than quantity. And, um, and so any requirement to, to, to extend things here would be on the basis, for example, of the decision Kingsford or down at the beach, and we'd build, build that in there. But ideally, we've got another pitch here where we can play um, reserve or women's games with bleachers people can watch. But probably the real priority, honestly, would be to have an indoor facility uh, itself and then uh, de- you know, then obviously depending with the new stadium do we need to extend the building this year it's already I'm out here just now I'm in Stephen Glass's office they're out training um, and it's already chock a block here um, so yeah the, the short answer is we do have plans we'd like to execute here but boy Martin what an incredible environment for people to be in here you know and listen we've we, the last week or so, we've had Rangers and Celtic young teams up here, and I think we've won every game. Mm. You know, I see that. We've yeah. played here. And, um, but it's just a fantastic game. And let me tell you, it makes a difference selling people coming to Aberdeen versus you take them to Big Tawdry and they say, so where are the training pitches? Oh, they're on the outskirts of town, you know, of the barracks and, and these places. So um, we're thankful for what we've got, but yes, we'd like a wee bit more. Mm-hmm. Rob, mm-hmm. anything else than that? 
No, I think that's absolutely right, Dave. When we when we visited Atlanta, when I was there in September of, of 2018, one of the things that stood out was their what they called their show pitch, where they had some some grandstands for about two and a half thousand people. And if we were able to have something, perhaps not even at that scale, even for a thousand or fifteen hundred people, I think would make a a real difference out there and and, and make more of the facility almost give us a a, a second home in a way, um, which would be very special. Um, and I think, yeah, with the, with the changes we've seen in the, in the football operation, um, as Dave says, we're, we're sort of bursting at the seams a little bit. So we, we either need to go, go up or go out to, to, to expand the, the, the existing pavilion. Um, but uh, exciting. And I, I haven't been into the Cormac Park much at all because of, it's been a bubble for the, for the first team for, for, for much of COVID. But being in there the, the other day for a, a PCR test before going to Iceland, just the, the buzz is just amazing. It is really tremendous. And uh, I think Scott Brown's the first one in, and I think he's locking up as well. He's, he's so excited <laughs> about being there. Brilliant. Him, and, him and Jet are the, um, are the just brilliant personalities that are in there. And it really is quite harmonious. The young boys, the yeah. development players trained for five weeks with the first team. I mean, we've made a decision, rightly or wrongly, Stephen did, not to, 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 to avoid any COVID issues other clubs had by staying here. And um, even games amongst ourselves, we brought referees and linesmen in, so they were real kind of challenge games. And of course, three of the friendlies we had here had to be postponed, or had to be canceled because of the other, of the other clubs. But uh, I also think as well, um, not being seen out there and anything that's televised probably helped us in that first game against Hecken. Yeah, I would say so. I think we were a bit of a, an unknown quantity, that's for sure. Good stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, moving moving away from the stadium and maybe just kind of looking at some other hot topics at, at the minute. What One uh, it was just getting spoken about on, on Twitter yesterday, actually, uh, is why I included it, is um, I suppose... More on the player kind of transfer side of things, and um, you know, respective values for our players and, and Scottish based players versus some of the, the fees that you see going around for, for guys that are moving from the, the English Championship, especially. So, is that you know, how frustrating is it for, for you guys when you're, you're getting offers for some of your best players and they're you know, they're, they're not even a tenth maybe of, of what some of the, the English Championship players are, are moving for down south? Yeah, again, a good question, Martin. The reality is, is that um, it's our goal here to make um, not to do not to do bad deals, right? Whether that be buying players or whether or getting players to us or whether it be selling players, right? And I think Stephen's approach to this: listen, we've got a big squad that's there. People can argue about the balance of the squad, midfielders versus this and that. But what I can tell you is, is that the wage bill. The wage bill for this season that we're in now with it, all the acquisitions we made of players early on, overall the club wage bill will be um, at or higher than, than the season we just came out of. And obviously, you know, as I've said, we're predicting about two and a half million of losses this year. You know, it becomes a bit of a challenge. However, having said that, um, Stephen and Stephen Gunn and... Um, and also Darren Mowbray, our new head of recruitment. I mean, they're working every single day that's available, the hours that are available. We've, we've been out looking at players and players we want to bring in, some of whom the fans have, have put up on the website, but it takes two to tangle. And, and you know, some of these players or players we've looked for, clubs are wanting four or 500,000 for a player that's got, you know, a year left on their contract. And financially, coming out of COVID, and given where we are with this year's projection, we just can't do it. But that doesn't mean to say we're not bring, looking to bring players in, but Stephen wants to bring players in that will make a tangible difference. Or their younger players, like Lewis came in to us, that are out with our academy, that we can develop and monetize. Because if you're going to have a philosophy of, you know, operationally losing, let's say, two million a year, you have to balance that through the player sales. And of course, at the back of our minds, Rob, my mind and Kevin, our finance director, is that we've got a stadium to build. So there's a, there's a whole infrastructure there and a set of planning that we're looking at. But look, I'm comfortable the position that we're in. 
and we will add as appropriate to, to the squad, but it has to be the right value of, of guys kind of coming in. Some of the, you know, we've been quoted some players that are maybe average players, eight, nine, 10,000 a week. And it's just not sustainable at a club, you know, like us. We've got a, a squad. Yes, we'd like to bring in probably another striker and, and some other positions. But there's a January window as well that we are looking to two for one or two other players. And there may be one or two players in January that sign pre-contracts with us who are, we've been quoted ridiculous money for. So I'm rambling on a bit here, but suffice to say, we'd all like to bring in a couple of more players, but we've got to get the right balance in there. And it has to make, um, it has to make financial uh, sense as well. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Maybe tied into that kind of question. Um, this might seem like a bit of a left field one and, and, and a wee bit of a niche question, but something that's kind of just been bubbling away in the background and maybe isn't, a, isn't entirely clear to, to myself is just the implications of Brexit and, and what that does to the Scottish market um, in, 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 in terms of the English market as well. So from outside anyway, it looks as though English clubs are a bit more restricted about who they can bring in now. Um, and I was just wondering if that then makes the Scottish market a bigger priority for them and potentially, you know, bumps up the, the value of our players um, to, to them. Is that something that you've, you've looked at or you've got a clear picture on? Well, the reality is, is that with the, with the offers that not just Aberdeen have had, Hibs have had for players, younger players, is just, um, you know, that, that has a kind of, kind of borne fruit. What I will tell you is, is that, Brexit has hammered English clubs. And listen, there are championship clubs and first division, division one clubs in England that have got real financial problems right now with financial fair play. So, um, so on the one hand, you know, um, being restricted more to UK players, you'd think would help us. And on the other hand, financial fair play, there are clubs. I mean, there are clubs that um, um, you know, can't, can't just will not pay in the championship and league one can pay fees that they were paying, you know, before. Mm. Um, I think it will kind of wash through. It, it hurts us a little bit as well, because, you know, we were just expanding and we are our scouting network into, you know, to the, to the Slovak countries, you know, and, um, and now we have to justify players coming in. We had to justify, you know, um, Obviously, a Christian coming in, which was fair enough to do from, from the States. Um, but that's another factor for us now looking at the European market is how can we bring players in that aren't necessarily internationals playing for Croatia, Bosnia and places like that. So I think, Martin, it's something that's evolving. Mm. One thing I will I'll we'll mention is this is, is that you've got the, the Scandinavian countries who by all accounts, um, right, we know are, have better international teams performance-wise overall than we have just now. They're developing more technical players. And so there, there's a guy called Tom Vernon who set up the Right to Dream Academy in Ghana, and they're just setting up now in, um, in, 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 in Egypt as well. They bought Norseland, um, a Superliga team in Denmark in 2015. In the last two seasons, They've sold three young players, one to Sampdoria, one to Ajax, and one to Cincinnati in the States for a combined 21 million euros, right? And they just sold a player they took out the Ghanaian Academy, Suleimani, to Rennes for 21 million euros, 16 million up front. So we have to look at ourselves and say, what the hell's wrong with our players? Mm. Why, is it, why aren't these clubs looking at our players? That's something Scottish football needs to look at. And I do think that there's a feeling out there, mainly in England, oh yeah, Scottish football's got real challenges financially. We'll just go in there and rape and pillage and yeah. just offer what we want to offer. And that pisses me off. It really does. I do not want us to be taken advantage of. And as much as we're going through financial pain, if people think that we're going to just take it because we need to take it, then no way. We're going to get value for our players at Aberdeen. And, um, and, and so that's kind of how I feel uh, 
I, I kind of feel about it, but it's it's evolving. But England are having their chance. I can tell you there are teams in League One in England that were paying five thousand a week for players that are now capping it at two and a half thousand a week. Mm. Yeah, no, as you said, it's a definitely an evolving situation. But I think, yeah, from a fan point of view, it's reassuring to hear that we're, you know, d- despite maybe being in a, a, a wee bit of difficulty, that we're not going to take the first offer that comes along. So that's. That's good. That's reassuring. Okay. Um, just a couple of questions left. I'm kind of conscious of you guys' time as well. Don't don't want to keep you keep you here all day. So just just a few more. Um, just uh, a thought around the the, the Colt team situation. We've obviously um, got the the Rangers and Celtic Colt teams um, playing in the the Lowland League this season. Um, what what's a club's stance on on Colt teams overall being in the in the Scottish leagues um, and specifically, obviously. The potential us um, in, in our cult team. How do you see that? Yeah, so it's it's kind of really simple, which is that you know the the looking at player development and player pathway in its own is 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 one aspect of what we need to look at in Scottish football, Martin. We've got to look holistically at the whole picture, right? Because right now the SPL doesn't have a clear vision, strategy, and a plan, right? And so we can, hearts, hibs, us can invest tens of millions, right? But we're only as good as the, um, as the center there in developing our game. So that is what, and I'm going to come back to it. I'm not ignoring it, but I'm trying to tell you is, is that many of us feel that, that the broadcasting uh, assets that we've got are highly undervalued. 25 million a year or whatever it is from Sky, which is more than we had before. We think it should be 50 million a year if you do look at all the comparisons. So, but but so what we need to do as a league overall, Martin, is to say who do we want to be? If the right people in place, the right places to get these commercial deals done. Because if we can add 10 to 15 million a year to Scottish football, then everybody gets lifted up. A rising tide lifts all ships, whether it be elite full-time teams or the part-time community teams. But coming back to the Colt side, then our perspective and many others' perspective is, is that why didn't Hearts and Kibbs get invited to the Lowland League? Why was this done separately to um, all the other teams? Yeah. And we didn't know about it, you know? And so um, I, I think the Colt teams have merit because, listen, last night we played Broader Rangers, right? And we had a really young team, very young team. And um, we won 1-0. But these guys were playing against men, right? And there's experience that men have got versus other young players haven't gained, you know, been streetwise on the pitch. And so I think if there's going to be the opportunity to have kind of cult teams, it needs to be a fair level playing field for every club to want to do it. There's a lot of merit in doing it. Um, and, but it would have to be that level playing field. It's not a case of, you know, two clubs throwing three million at the lower league teams, right, to get into the league, to do stuff like that. It has to be a wider conversation about what the right thing overall for Scottish football is. And from my perspective, um, we need to be committed as clubs having cult teams to Scottish football for the longer term. Yeah, no, 100% agree. I think there is probably merit in it and it could probably have a knock-on effect to the national team and, and you know, overall player development, but it needs to it needs to apply to us all. Um, otherwise, it's just for the benefit of two teams as far as I can see. Okay, that's good. Um, last question then, really, um, and, and to you both. Um, what are... What do you what do you hope to see out of this season? Not just on the pitch, but what are what are kind of the realistic realistic aspirations for us um, across the board? What, what do you hope to get out of this season, Rob? Yeah, let, uh, let, let me talk off off, off the uh, or behind the scenes and, and and not on the pitch to start with. That you know, yeah. for, for me, this is about getting the club back on track commercially um, and through through the the, the tail end of the pandemic. Um, you know, everything's taken a knock in, in, in some way or, 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 or shape or form. So there's a, there's a big piece of work to be done there. Fundamentally, I think though, trialing and, and making the most of our, our fan engagement initiatives that we've talked about earlier on the call, I think that's going to be a key driver for us. 
getting people signed up to, to single sign on and improving their journey and, and their experience with the club is going to be important. Um, and, you know, at, at the end of the day for us, you know, so much of what we can do commercially depends on, on, on what happens on the park. And, you know, we, we have to budget in the right way and, 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 and in an appropriate way in terms of how far we think we might progress in each of the cup competitions and, and where we might finish in the league. Um, there, there is an, an overwhelming sense of, you know, there's something special going on at the club at the moment. And, and a lot of that has been driven by what we're seeing on the park. Um, it is truly enjoyable to be back and watching Aberdeen Football Club play games. It is really, you know, it, it's, it's exciting. Um, it's really a pleasure to watch. And hopefully that transpires over the longer term. Um, and, you know, hopefully translates into something that we can all be really proud of, of this season. Um, you know, hopefully somewhere along the line, there will be some silverware. So, Dave, I'll, I'll let you finish. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree, Rob. Listen, um, this is, Martin, this is the most competitive league, you know, for the last ten, oh, yeah. in 10 years. Yeah, yeah, you've got, it's great that we got Hearts back up. It's great that we got Dundee back up because our fans love the experiences of going there, right? And listen, Hearts and Hibs have been through it. And um, listen, yeah, these guys will be, a little, I think they're at 12,000 season ticket sales themselves. So they've got the income to be really competitive with Aberdeen Football Club. But, you know, I think it, it starts out with, there's no guarantees. The only thing I've learned as well in football is there's no guarantees in football. That we should be setting out every season to try and win something. If you don't set out to do that, you know, I mean, listen, I can't guarantee it's going to happen. We've got real competition now, particularly with Hearts and Hibs. But... I believe our strategy and our vision, the young boys coming through that are getting a chance right now. I mean, you know, you just look at Calvin uh, has come through, um, Jack McKenzie, boy, that boy, I mean, he's a, a young, maybe a young Doug Rugby, I may be doing him an injustice there. But I want to tell you, you'll be getting some leaders in there like Decky and getting Scott Brown in there, right? There's, there's a, camaraderie in there right now and you know what's really good as well martin is the the the, the, the youth academy the players coming through the coaches the players their parents believe their boys are going to get a chance yeah. you know yeah. and yeah. There are some young boys coming through that are talented young guys so we've got to be careful we don't block those pathways as well martin right and um and so that's the, the, the balancing act. But look, um, you don't start out a season without saying we'd like to win something. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am a, people that kind of know me back from my business days are that I want to win everything. You know, I hate getting beat at anything. And um, I'd love us to win something, but the competition is there, but bring it on. Yeah, 100%. No, totally agree with all that. It's uh, exciting times again. I think after last season, you know, everybody was a bit, down in the dumps in it. It wasn't the same watching it at home. So uh, just exciting times ahead and I'm, I'm looking forward to it personally. No, that's great. Um, just one one last question for you, actually, Dave. What's, uh, what have you got to say about these rumours about being spotted on the pitch uh, last weekend when the winner went in? <laughs> oh, you mean at, at Livingston? Aye. <laughs> well, uh. <laughs> no, um, my days are running on the pitch are gone. I, I was actually at Wembley in 77 when we beat England, but I didn't oh, get Oh, so you've done it properly. I, didn't get, I was 80,000 Scottish fans. I didn't get on the pitch, but uh, um, no, I, I um, listen, last weekend, I know you were there, right? I was, eh? and, I, and I know a few boys that were on the pitch because they've texted <laughs> me, right? But uh, listen, I just think that was pent up exuberance, no malice, and you know, it's just fantastic to see. It's listen, yeah, you haven't been an away game, right? A thousand Aberdeen fans for a long, long, long time. And listen, Livingston is a really tough place to go to that pitch and the style they've got. I mean, not many teams are gonna come there out of there with a win. No. Right. Mm. And 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 we'll take that ugly win. But uh, I loved Jack McKenzie cutting inside there. And I think in his interview after the game. He said the shot was too hot to too handle, hot to handle. <laughs> which I thought was uh, was superb. And um, yeah, look, um, we've all been through a lot, Martin. Um, but my message really of this is is that um, we want to do the best for our club, 
all of us are involved with the club. We're not perfect. We make mistakes, judges and how we respond. We'll not agree on everything, you know, but we're better together. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. Um, good, good note to finish on. I think that. So, uh, no, really appreciate your, your time, guys. Um, it's been that's been really good, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll be uh, celebrating another victory tomorrow night. Well, it would be great to get through, Martin, to the uh, for the first time since what two thousand and eight or something to a group, um, you know, to the, the the playoff round. And remember back in the day then when Jimmy Calder was deemed it great getting through. There was one, we had one qualifying round to go through to get that's through. Right, yeah. Yeah, And if, if I might just add this too as well, it's something that we're going to be lobbying for, which is that this so-called third competition, I mean, you're going, to have a, you're going to have a Spurs or somebody win it, right? Because when you drop down for the Champions League to the Europa League, and then you drop down from there into the group stages of the conference, I mean, it just is an unfair environment mm-hmm. to stack yeah. all these teams you know, through that, and that's another kind of set of question. But we're ending up, we're playing pretty much the same teams that we would have played at this stage in the Europa League, right? Um, and so Brecken, uh, sorry, Brecken, Hecken were favourites along with Malmo to win the Swedish League this year. They started mm-hmm. off poorly, but um, changed their coach and um, very, very good team. Excellent team. We saw, obviously, Malmo last night. Um, and so there's a lot we can learn in Scottish football from how Scandinavia goes about this, and we shouldn't be too proud to look at that. No, 